Welcome to the ministry of Living on the Edge with Chip Ingram. We trust that the upcoming message will inspire, encourage, and motivate you to apply what you learn as you live out your faith in Christ at home and at work each day. At the end of the message, you'll find information on how to contact Living on the Edge or obtain additional resources. Now, here's Chip. We're going to talk about Spiritual Warfare 201, how to prepare for the spiritual battle. And I want to give you a little word picture. It's a historical situation, but I think it's the best way to capture exactly where we're at. I told you my dad was in the South Pacific, and uh, after World War II ended, uh, there was a treaty signed. We were at peace, and yet on multiple islands throughout the South Pacific, the battle raged. There was guerrilla warfare. The bullets were just as real. The war is over. The victory is done. A treaty has been signed. And yet, Marines were on islands and people were in tunnels who were committed to killing the other people even though there was nothing at stake with regard to the relationship between the countries or the world powers. They were engaged in guerrilla warfare. The war was over, but the battle continued. And, and the day before the treaty was signed, there were some young men that died. And the day after the treaty was signed, the bullets were just as real, the mortars fired with the same kind of reality and impact, and people died. And we are living in a day now where when Jesus died on the cross, he broke the power of sin. He disarmed and triumphed over the enemy, Satan. Uh, eternal life, we've been taken from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. We are positioned, we are in Jesus, seated with him in the heavenly places. We have a new beginning. The old things are past, behold, all things become new. And yet, there's guerrilla warfare going on to damage and discredit and to shoot and to fire and to discourage and ruin your life and my life in the churches. And so what we're gonna find is, is that um, there are clear commands and clear protection to be victorious in the skirmishes and the battle. On the front of your notes, you'll notice it says that Satan was in fact defeated at the cross. The penalty for all time for all people was paid at the cross. Sin's power was broken, and yet this host of fallen angels engage in this guerrilla warfare. And notice we're gonna cover these things. To deceive, discourage, divide, and destroy God's people and God's program. And so God says, he wants to equip you and he wants to prepare you to walk in the strength of the Lord and in the strength of his power so that you can withstand the enemy's schemes and multifaceted attacks and that you can defeat him in the specific battles in your life, at your work, in your family, and at your church. And so, you know, the big question is, how does that work? How does, how does this really play out? And what I want to say is that's the topic of this whole thing on the invisible war. In session number one, I think the answer begins with becoming aware of the battle. That's all we wanted to cover last night. If you went home last night or got in a small group or opened your Bible and your eyes were opened and you said, whoa, this is real. Look at all these verses. And as that guy was talking last night, I was aware that I've given all kind of common sense cause and effect to everything. There is a spiritual battle. That's step one. Because if you don't know you're in a battle, you'll never win. Step two is today appropriating God's ongoing protection for daily living. God's given us some armor. You need to know how to put it on, how to use it, and that's Spiritual Warfare 201. In our third session, we'll look at learning to engage the enemy with supernatural weapons. There's times where you need to go on the offense, and we're gonna learn how to do that in Spiritual Warfare 301, and then finally, discovering God's means of deliverance. When you begin to take territory, when you get involved in ministry, when you want a break, a stronghold or a habit that's been in your life, you may find yourself with real encounter with demonic influence. How do you break out of that? How do you be delivered by the power of God? What's the scripture say? Now, turn the page if you will. Let's dig in together and let's read the passage and let's discover how to prepare yourself for, sat for satanic attack from Ephesians 6, 13, 14, and 15. Therefore, take up the full armor of God. Why? That you may be able to resist in the evil day. 
And having done everything to stand firm, stand firm therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. This is a picture of a mighty general calling the troops to assembly. And he puts them in rows, and he says, in front of each one of you, I want you to know there's an M16, and there's a helmet, and there's a backpack, and there is a special vial in here if you're under gas attack, and there's a gas mask. Now, listen up. Take up your equipment right now. There's a sense of urgency here. The tense of the verb has the idea of right now. Get up, get ready, take up notice. It's something that you do. God doesn't do this for you. The verb here is a point in time, a peculiar time where he says, take up the full armor of God. It's the general, the Lord Jesus Christ, urgently saying to all of his children, Everything you need to defeat the enemy, I'm putting at your feet. Now, I want you to take it up. And if it was a Marine, it would be a certain kind of rifle and a a flak jacket and a helmet and a backpack. But Paul lives in a different day, so he's going to use the picture of a Roman soldier. And by the way, it's a metaphor. It's just a picture. He's just drawing on what they're familiar with so they understand the kind of protection. And he's going to say to them, put on the belt of truth. He's gonna say to them, there's armor, there's a breastplate of righteousness. I want you to put that on. He's gonna say, you know those sandals that have the knobs on the bottom and have the little uh, nails and that you wrap around up to here? I want you to put these things on and get ready. Why? To stand firm. Now, don't think of stand firm here as the idea of something is coming against you and you are just to stand firm. It is to hold the ground that you already have. Imagine, if you will, here's the kingdom of darkness. You've come out of the kingdom of darkness. This stage is the kingdom of light. You've been adopted. You've been sealed with the spirit. You've been given spiritual gifts. You're a part of a body. You have a spiritual inheritance. You have forgiveness. You have peace. You have the fruit of the spirit. All of this territory with the work of Christ, when you prayed to receive Christ, it occurred, you now possess it as a child of God. What he's saying is, all of this is who you are. Ephesians chapter one, two, and three. Walk in that way. Now, stand firm. Hold on to what you possess because darts are gonna come and lies are gonna come and people are gonna come and circumstances are gonna come to tell you you're not worthy, you don't have peace, God doesn't love you. Why should you forgive someone else? And it will encroach and encroach and encroach on your life until how you live and how you think actually looks not much different than how you used to live and how you used to think and how you used to treat people and where your priorities used to be. See, this standing firm is not just like you're standing and something's coming at you. You are holding on to that area that you've already possessed. Imagine an army that has taken a town and now what do they want to do? They want to hold their position so the enemy can't take take back that territory. Stand firm, he says, urgently, why? To enable you for those difficult times, for the evil day. By the way, a very interesting uh, little picture there. The evil day means on a particular day at a particular time. the, The battles aren't all the same, are they? I mean, there's not like this invisible coming at you every day in every way. When he says the evil day here, he's saying there are specific opportunities and times when the enemy is going to come and try and deceive you or discourage you or to turn you away from your general and commander, the Lord Jesus. On those kind of times when, are you ready? When you're tired, when you've had a little conflict with your mate, when the economy drops and you didn't realize how much of your security was in that 401k, Uh, when you're in the ICU with one of your kids and you're wondering whether they're going to make it and you're tempted to believe God's not a good God, when you've prayed and prayed and prayed and asked God for something and circumstances turn just the opposite and you hear this little voice that says, see, God doesn't hear your prayers. Why, why are you living like this? When you're a single person and unlike most of your contemporaries, even in the church, you're living a pure life 
and you're not getting a lot of dates, and a lot of people seem to be going out and, quote, having a lot of fun, and you have this condemnation that says, you fool, you, you are missing out on life. You see, what, what he's saying is, is that there are different times in different people's lives. There will be an evil day, and you must be able to oppose or resist him. You need to come against him. You need to be able to guard your territory so that who you are in Christ doesn't get negated in how you think, how you begin to talk, and how you begin to live. And now he's going to tell us, well, you know, big specific command number two in verse 14, after picking up your armor in preparation for battle, we're commanded to, and, and the sense of the grammar here is consciously, vigorously make a decisive act or at times a succession of acts to stand your ground firmly and fearlessly against the enemy's assaults as he seeks to deceive, accuse, and discourage. And then he says, here's how to do it. The way you do that is you stand firm by putting on the full armor of God. And what I want to do in our time remaining is unpack the full armor of God. These first three pieces, notice that as you look in your Bible, you know, you can see that there's uh, about six pieces of armor. The first three are all defensive. I want you to also notice the tense of the verb. You can see it in your notes or in your Bible. It says, having girded your loins. They're, part, they're participles. The, the one main verb is to stand firm. And it says how to stand firm. There's a list of participles. Having girded your loins with truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Having have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And the point I want to make is what he's saying is the way you stand firm and hold your ground against the enemy is these things have to have already occurred. They, they have to be a practice in your life for you to live out this new life. And then what he's going to do is say, let me explain to you what it looks like by going through each of these pieces of the armor. And before I go through the pieces, I want to make this is not in your notes. You might want to pull out your, your pen or pencil for just a minute. Just a couple observations about this armor. And, you know, commentators will say, uh, you know, this is Paul was thinking maybe of uh, a picture of God because there's some Isaiah passages where God puts on the shield of faith. And other commentators will say, well, it's a Roman soldier, except, you know, Roman soldier, he also had a spear and he had this and that. It's a metaphor. It, it, it's, just, it's just a picture to help us understand the general thinking of how we are to prepare ourselves for battle. It's not mechanical. Now, I, I've read or been at times and heard people speak and, and you get sort of this, okay, I'm gonna pray on my belt of honor and now I'm gonna do this and then I'm gonna do that and then I'm gonna do this. It's a, it's a relationship, it's a metaphor. It's how you live out a living relationship with Jesus. Okay, it's not some mechanical thing that you do a certain way each day. It's to help you understand how to live out a relationship in the power of the Spirit by God the Father. Now, is it important to pray and understand what these things are and apply them? Yes. But there's not some mystical, mechanical way that you can just go through steps one, two, three, and four, and then your armor is always on. Because what we're going to see is this is about practice. This is something you do. The tense of these verbs are also in a voice that say, God has given you the armor. It's your responsibility to pick it up, put it on, and to practice it. So, so let's walk through what this armor is. In each one, here's the format. I'll give you the metaphor, and I'll talk about what it was on a Roman soldier so you can kind of get a snapshot in your mind. Then we'll talk about the meaning of the word, truth, righteousness, or gospel. And then after that, what we'll do is talk about what does that really look like in real life? for just normal, ordinary people like you and me. So, having girded your loins with truth. The metaphor explained, if you will. A Roman soldier had a belt, and on that belt, all the rest of the armor was hooked. And on that belt, if it was winter, you know, you see the pictures like in the movies where they have the kind of the little skirts that they wear. Uh, well, if it was winter, and they did a lot of conquering, they had a long robe. And if a Roman soldier had his belt loosened, he was off duty. If a Roman soldier was on duty and his belt was loosened, uh, the consequences were very severe. The very first thing a Roman soldier could do, the order that he's giving us 
in is very, very instructive and important. The first thing he would do, he was put on his belt. And to gird up your loins is kind of a weird expression. What it really means is he would take that long robe, lift it up, and tuck it into his belt because now he's ready. Now he's ready. He's ready for battle. You know, it's one thing to be on a march and stay warm, and, but now, battle cry, enemy attack, what do you do? Tighten the belt, take your robe, tuck it in, tuck it in here. The sword goes where? On the belt. And we find later the shield would actually attach to the belt. And so that's the picture. The word truth here means candor, sincerity, truthfulness. It's rooted in the objective reality of the truth of God's word. But here, it refers to the subjective, practical application of openness and honesty in all things with God and men. See, he's already told us that the truth is in Christ. He's already given us three chapters of truth. What's already true of you? You're accepted in the beloved. You've been redeemed. You've been bought with the price. You're a part of God's family. You've been sealed with the Spirit. But when he says, this is the part that you do, you put on the belt of truth. This is the practical application of you seeing God, seeing yourself, and seeing others through the worldview and the clarity of what is accurate and true. It means you don't play games. It means you're not deceived. It means you're honest with God, you're honest with yourself, and you're open when the Spirit of God speaks to you. By contrast, the enemy is constantly whispering. Here's his number one tactic. What's he want to do? Deceive, deceive, deceive. What was his tactic the very first time we ever hear of Satan? He was crafty, and what did he do to Eve? He deceived her. How did he deceive her? He did it multiple ways, but he said, first of all, he questioned God's goodness. Then he questioned the accuracy of the truth that she knew. Well, surely you won't die. Then he took some truth that was really true and said, if you eat this, this will give you the knowledge of good and evil. That was actually true. Then he'll take truth and he'll twist it. Then he'll make sin look appealing. You know what? She looked at it and it was appealing to the eyes and to make one wise and then he, he lies to her about the consequences. You're, nothing's gonna happen bad. And you know that MO has not changed? That really MO, he's crafty. And he tells me and he tells you You know, unless you have a lot of stuff, you'll never be happy. You'll never be happy. The key to happiness is just turn on the TV and watch every commercial. If you want that beautiful blonde to jump in your car, you gotta have that kind of car. Or you gotta drink that kind of beer. Or you know what, you gotta have this kind of face. And have you noticed the reality shows here in America now? I mean, the makeovers, the the plastic surgeries, the we're we're re we're reframing and remodeling people's houses, and then you know, okay, we're trading places. And then we went from that to uh, trading mates, and now we're actually trading bodies, and people kind of come in this way and out that. What's behind that lie? Who you are and how you're made as you are doesn't measure up. What you have doesn't measure up. If you want to be significant, if you want to be lovable, if you want to be accepted, if you want to be secure, if you want to be a someone, if you want to be happy, you need, and then you fill in the blank, and it's a lie. It's a lie. And we're buying it. We can go to church on Sunday morning, read the Bible in the morning, pray a few prayers, and let the media infiltrate our thinking to the point that we raise our kids just about the same way the world raises their kids. We handle our money just about the same way the world handles their money. We talk and live and act and are honest about the same way the world. Why? We're deceived. But by the way, when this is happening, when you're deceived, it's not like you're going around going, hey, I'm a deceived Christian. I'm a deceived Christian. I don't really know what's going on. I'm getting suckered every day in every way. When you're deceived, you're deceived. You're absolutely convinced you're doing the right thing for the right reason with the right motive and you're pleasing to God. I mean, Eve didn't take a bite of that apple going, boy, this is going to be bad news. She took a bite thinking, This is going to be the best thing I ever get. And I I got got news for you. I think the first bite of whatever fruit it was tasted great. God made it. I think it tasted wonderful. 
And then, bang. I put down a few lies that I thought we tend to believe. Take care of yourself first and foremost. Nobody else will. Right? That's the American way. It's not in your notes. Just lean back, okay? This is not the time to say, hey, I need to write that down. This is time to say, God, do you want to write that in? Okay? This is like, how many of these have I bought? Because it's not a matter of if, we all do. The Bible was written centuries ago, and in many areas, it's just not relevant anymore. You know, this one, this one, this one, and this one, I believe that, but at work when someone brings up this other subject, I mean, like I'm not going to look like some anti-intellectual fool and say, well, the Bible says, have you bought the lie? Or truth is relative. You know, what's true for me isn't necessarily true for other people. Or what's true for you, that, that doesn't mean, I mean, just because the Bible said, that's your convictions, but that's different for me. It's a lie. If God was loving, he wouldn't let these bad things happen. It's a lie. Stand up for your rights regardless of the consequences. Fight. I know the Bible says you're not supposed to sue, but he probably wasn't really a Christian, and this is what happened in this church, and I'll tell you what, man, I'll, take, I'll sue his pants off, and I'll get all my money back. It's better, brethren, to uh, be defrauded than defame the name of the church and God. And I read in periodicals today where Christian leaders are suing other Christian leaders. See, he says, put on the belt of truth. Satan's first attack was deception. And what our response is, is hiding, denial, and blame shifting. And that hasn't changed much either, has it? We, we, we see the truth about ourselves, and I don't know about you, but it's painful. And it takes such courage to face the truth, we just kind of go into denial. That, that really couldn't be happening. That can't be true of me. Or if you do see it, then you do what Eve, you know what? Hey, first he goes to Adam. Adam, what in the world did you do? And he says, oh, you know that woman? I don't know who created her, but <laughs> man alive, it's her fault. Eve, what's the deal? I don't know who created the snake, but it's his fault. Yeah. And what do we do? It's my wife's fault. It's the economy's fault. It's my boss's fault. You see, the belt of truth begins with getting honest and owning your own stuff without excuses, without blaming, and saying, God, until I get honest with you, there's no hope to live and defend and stand firm against the lies because his goal is deception. Kenneth Wiest writes, the best of truth is the man or woman whose mind will practice no deceit and no disguises in their walk with God. I uh, have an application here that I've jotted down, Psalm 139, 23, and 24, and it is a passage that I think is well worth not just memorizing, but maybe uh, more importantly, it's well worth applying. David, a man after God's own heart, and we sure learn from him, that doesn't mean you have it all together, right? I mean, his morality wasn't ship shape. So what made David a man after God's own heart? What made David a man after God's own heart was when confronted with his sin, he did what we all do. He was in denial. Then he went to blame shifting, and then he hid it. And then God brought Nathan and said, you're the man. And when he finally saw the truth, it broke his heart. And the recording of David's confession is Psalm 51. And then in Psalm 139, I think David learned something, is to keep short accounts with God. And Psalm 139, 23, and 24 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and see if there be any wicked way in me. And then lead me in the everlasting way. That is a good prayer to pray, like every day. God, search me. As far as I know... As far as I know, I think I'm right with you. As far as I know, I think my relationships are okay. But search me. And by the way, when God begins to speak, He won't speak in vague, you know, you're a really bad person or you need to be a better mother. Or you the Spirit of God will convict. And conviction is specific because His desire is never to condemn. It's always to draw you back in intimate relationship with the Father. I, uh, I remember my first, and I've had many, 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 but I'll share one uh, quick story of not having the belt of truth on but not knowing it. 
I was a young Christian, and uh, when I grew up, I had a little mantra in our house, and my dad was a Marine, and uh, the goal then was to, you know what, son, here's how life works. Some people get up early, some people get up late. Get up early. Uh, son, this is how life works. Some people set goals and some people don't set goals. Son, this is how life works. Some people set goals and set strategies and go for it, and some people don't set strategies and go for it. Son, this is how life works. Some people really want it bad enough, and some people don't. You want it bad enough, and you'll be successful. And by the way, here's how, here's how life works. If you're successful, you'll be happy. And so by seventh grade, I'm, I'm, I'm an emerging workaholic. I mean, I, I got written goals for the kind of girl I'm going to date, what, what I'm going to be in basketball, baseball, scholarship to school, you know, grades, honor roll, the whole nine yards. I got up early, set some goals, developed some strategies, got to be a senior, hit about 90% of them. I came to Christ because a girl turned to me and said, wow, you've really got it made. She began to list all these, quote, successes. And I thought, wow, this formula doesn't work because I'm the emptiest guy on the face of the earth. And I'm the phoniest guy because I learned the strategies. If you want to get a really nice girl, you act real sweet to really nice girls. You want to be the captain on the basketball team and you want to score a lot of points. You cuss a lot in the locker room and someone crosses you. You get the biggest guy on the team to be your buddy and you knock his clock off. <laughs> you just do what you got to do. And so I figured out how to be all these different people and I found Christ and I got liberated and I got transformed. And, you know, in my case, they gave me a Bible. No one said I had to read it. I read it in the morning. I read it at night. And I thought someone had a tape recorder under my bed. It was so real and so powerful and so transforming. And no one taught me how to pray. So I just talked to God like I would a friend. And, hey, God, me, Chip, how are you doing today? And, and, uh, and, and I was doing some things that I knew were really wrong and the, the fizz went out of them. I just, they felt dirty. I didn't want to be there. I, God just, my internal want-tos began to change. And I didn't know about Ephesians. I didn't know who I was in Christ. All I knew was these new desires. I wanted to be God's man. I didn't want to be over here anymore. And then I went away to a college and I met a group of people that were great in terms of discipleship. And, you know, the first probably nine months or a year, I couldn't explain it. I'd just whistle and I found myself singing and I got up and I, I, it was just a delight to be with God. I mean, I just couldn't believe, I'm free. I didn't have to be a phony. And then I got with the group and see all, all that baggage, all that stuff you learn, just because you go from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, it doesn't all go away overnight. And uh, so then I found out that, you know, people really liked you in this group a lot if you memorize verses. So, you know, if someone's going to memorize two, you know, I'm Ingram, I'm going to memorize six. And then you need to be in a Bible study. So I'm not only in one, I'm going to leave one. And then you need to have band to man time with someone. So I'm not only going to have it, but I'm going to have it with five or six other guys. And then I found out that, I'll tell you what, if you, if you learn how to do some other things, and so I learned, boy, I'll tell you what, every day I would pray, and I never missed a day, and I went through my prayer list, and it took me about two and a half years. I lost all my joy. I forgot all of my delight. I became a legalistic Pharisee who had no joy, but I'll tell you what, I had hundreds of verses memorized. <laughs> and instead of a love and a compassion for people, you know what, here's what I did. I got up early, I set some goals, I set some strategies, and you know what? The belt of truth wasn't on. I was completely deceived. Completely deceived. I thought I was super Christian, and I was getting rewarded in this little culture on this campus ministry. Way to go, super Christian. Do you know Chip? He has lots of verses memorized. Do you know Chip? He never misses a day. Do you know Chip? He has a quiet time. Do you know Chip? He shares his faith with everything that walks and moves. And, and then I met a girl that I, I, I met my first year in college, and we were, uh, you know, it was a campus that had all these brick buildings. It was beautiful, these mountains behind it. And then connecting all the buildings were sidewalks. It was called the Quadrangle. And I can tell you just about where I was and where the sun was. And we had a brief conversation, and she looked at me just out of the blue and said, you know, Chip, I remember your first year here. You were a really neat guy. That's not a great sentence to start off with. <laughs> And then she said, uh, you know, you just seem so happy. And I've never been, you know, real high on Christians. But you were the first one that I ever met that I thought, maybe there's something to it. And, you know, that was a couple years ago. And now every time I talk to you or any time I hear you, all you have is verses for people. And now all you have is religion. And you know something? If, if you are what it looks like to be a Christian, I don't think I'd ever want to be one. See you later.
The belt of truth was not, my armor was not on. I was deceived. I took all my old thinking, I translated into the Christian world, and I tried to get success, security, recognition, because I long to be loved and because I'm desperately insecure, just like everybody else in this room. And I played the game, and I was deceived. Now, I'd like to say that that happened 25 years ago, and I'm glad I got that behind me, but I find almost every week, or as I spend time with God, I am progressively being deceived in some way, and I have to get up and put the belt of truth on. And you know what that means? Being honest with God. It means being honest with people. It means that the, the Word of God has opportunity in my life to wash over my heart because it's the mirror that lets me know that's reality, Chip, and this is you. It means not quick little prayers in the car. It means long, significant seasons, not out of duty, but out of, Lord, I long to be your man. I long to hear your voice. And, and there's this, you, you have it, right? You know that little disquieting lack of peace? And you just cover it over, and when it comes up, you find if you eat something, you feel better, and if it comes up really bad, you go out to eat, and if it comes up really bad, you put on a movie, and when you get in the car, you've got to turn on some music, because whenever you're completely alone, and no one is around, and you have to really look at you, you don't like it. And you don't like it because you're deceived. And you don't like it because for many of us, it's been a long, long time since you had a prolonged, open time where you unzipped your heart and said, God, show me anything in here that doesn't line up with who you are. And when you've had those times, what do you do? You confess, and you meet a loving, gracious, forgiving God, and He washes over you, and He gives you peace. And then you have to be involved in meaningful relationships where people can talk to you. And they can talk about the, the little area over here, and your little snippy with your wife, and, you know, I see some arrogance coming in here. See, that's, you know, small group is just a methodology. You can be in a small group and not be honest at all. But you got to be in some kind of small group where you're really honest. And that's how you put on the belt of truth. The Word of God, prayer, openness with God, openness with people. That's why, jot this down. We have Psalm 34, 17. It says, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and those who are crushed in spirit. Brokenness is the evidence. You know, you know what happens? You know what brokenness really is? Brokenness is when you, on occasion, see the truth about who you really are. And all I can tell you is when I saw how hypocritical I was, when I saw how ugly what I thought I compared to what Christ-likeness was, I wept. I mean, I just wept. I just thought, I've been deluded. I'm not loving. I'm not compassionate. I'm not like Jesus. I'm like the Pharisees. And what I have to tell you is, I'm still going through that. I mean, I'm still going through that. Boy, you've, if you, I don't do it and I won't let you, but if you could read through, I write a lot in a journal. Man, I, I write out, oh God, God, I'm so sorry. I was in that meeting and I was posturing and I was trying to impress people and someone asked me a question and I didn't really know the answer, but I thought I knew the answer. So I just acted really confident and said, no, and, and they call me president now in this little organization. So they thought I was right. You know, and then you get up and pray and you have that going around in your heart and you go, oh, that is, is it? So what do you do? You put on the belt of truth. You confess your sin. By the way, if you're a defensive person, defensiveness is when God brings truth into your life and you're, you won't receive it, then the response of, is defensiveness. It's the way it is. The belt of truth. By the way, I've spent a little extra time on this one because... It is the first one. If the belt of truth isn't on, the breastplate of righteousness cannot happen. If the belt of truth isn't connected, then the sword that's going to go of the Word of God it is powerless. It starts with being honest with God, honest with yourself. And so, do you see what I mean by it's not just praying on, oh, I have the belt of truth today? It's not some mechanical thing. It's about your relationship with Jesus. It's about your relationship with God where you're absolutely honest, as far as it depends on you. And the Spirit of God will show you. After the belt of truth, he says, having put on the breastplate, which is righteousness. The metaphor here, the breastplate was made of bronze, or if you were a more affluent soldier, it could be a chain mail. It was from just below the neck to down to the thighs. And it was called the heart protector for obvious reasons. 
The word righteousness here means uprightness, right living, integrity in one's lifestyle and character. It's conforming our will with God's will. And again, although it is rooted in objective righteousness that we already possess in our standing before God through Christ's work, this breastplate of righteousness that guards and protects our heart is the practical application of the truth to our lives. In other words, it's the Lordship of Christ. You know, if you really wanna know, the belt of truth is just being honest with God. It's really what it is. It's being real and honest with God and people. The breastplate of righteousness, you wanna know how simple it is? It's applying the truth. It's the application of the truth that God gives you through his word or through community or in worship. It's saying, oh, that's true, and you apply it. And when you apply it, guess what? You have on the breastplate of righteousness. Because you are, you're standing, you are righteous before God because of the work of Christ. But if the first challenge or the first assault of Satan is deception, he's also called what? The accuser of the brethren. Guess what his second major way to attack you is? Condemnation. You know, I know people, they spend their whole life guilt motivated instead of grace motivated. They don't go to church because they long to be with people and love God. They go to church because they'd feel guilty if they didn't. They don't give money because they say, wow, I want to be involved in eternal things and love and bring life to people. They give money because they feel guilty if they don't. They speak in groups because if they didn't speak, they'd feel guilty. Or they don't speak because they just live with condemnation. And by the way, you, you search out behind sexual addictions, eating disorders, dysfunctional families, tell you what, all this junk gets played out psychologically in very, very warped ways. Because we, we gotta, I don't know about you, I hate, the, guilt is a killer. And then the, the enemy, but see, when you say you believe this and you know you're a Christian, but you're living your life like this, you know that discrepancy? You know what the enemy's doing? He's whispering stuff in your ears. You think God's gonna hear you? You call yourself a Christian? I mean, you call yourself a Christian, and if anyone knew of the people in this room that logged on in the internet in the last seven days, you call yourself a Christian, and you've got 75 pair of shoes because every time you feel down, you're addicted and you go shopping, you call yourself a Christian, and you eat, 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 and then go to the bathroom and throw up. You call yourself a Christian, and every time you hear a morsel of anything, because you have to feel significant, you find that you're the garbage can of the church. And so you ask questions and people tell you stuff and then you're the dispenser of information, of course, in the form of prayer requests. <laughs> Pray for them, you know they're going through a difficult time in their marriage. Pray for so-and-so because they've had to disconnect their cable because some of the family members are struggling with those sexual issues. The breastplate of righteousness is God reveals his truth. You're honest with him and you put it into practice. And as you are putting into practice what you know is true, you're the condemnation comes and you stand your ground. You say, that's a lie, Satan. I'm complete in Christ. Or you say, no, that's a lie, Satan. That was true. I was a phony. I confessed it to God and 1 John 1, 9 is true. If I confess my sins, he's faithful and he's just to what? Forgive my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I stand upon the shed blood of the Lord Jesus. I am complete in him. I am pure in him. Get away from me, Satan. I'm not gonna hear that trash. I'm not gonna listen to those thoughts. I don't need to eat. Food's not gonna satisfy this. I don't need to log on to, I don't need pseudo intimacy. I've got real intimacy. I'm not gonna play games. And do, do you hear in my voice a little sense of battle? A little sense of it's a, let's fight? You know how we pray? Oh God, I'm struggling so much because I'm a victim and I don't know what to do and I feel overwhelmed. And I, just, I, just, I just have to do this and I have this compulsion to do this and I'm so sorry. And I'll, I'll, I love this one. And I'll try harder next time. God doesn't want you to try harder. He wants you to do the right thing now. And he wants you to apply the truth, the power that you presently possess and by faith put on the breastplate of righteousness because what's it do? Man, those condemnations on your heart, you don't have to live there. You don't have to live there. He accuses us resulting in guilt and condemnation when we willfully turn away from what we know is God's will. 
we open ourselves to demonic attack. And if you think that's a little strong, I've given you an Old Testament and a New Testament example. You can read them for yourselves. Remember the story of Saul, 1 Samuel 15, right? God, through Samuel, says, Saul, this is what I want you to do. He has known truth. He has a role. This is what I'm supposed to do. He's supposed to wait for Samuel. He is afraid. Ha ha, I wonder who could bring that about. He is tempted to, rather than rely on God, take it in his own hands, in his own resources, to be self-sufficient instead of God-dependent. And so he does the exact opposite. He doesn't wait. Then he's a people pleaser. Uh, I, I save the sheep for an offering. Then he goes into denial. Then he rationalizes. Follow Saul's life from the moment he disobeys what he knows is true. Do you remember the rest of his life? He's plagued by demonic activity. And you think, well, that's, that's Old Testament and it's a king and that's kind of weird. Okay, New Testament example. Jesus is speaking. The disciples are here. He's got one of his greatest guys but has a little diarrhea of the mouth problem in Peter over here, guy we can all identify with. Who do men say that I am? Some think you are John the Baptist raised from the dead. Others think a prophet. Others think Elijah. Pete, who do you think I am? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, filled with the Spirit. Peter, way to go. That's not revealed to you by human flesh. That's from my Father. Now, by the way, let me tell you the truth. Let me tell you the truth about the game plan. From this day forward, I must go to the cross, and I will die, and I will suffer many things, and then I will be raised. Peter pops up. May it never be, Lord. Forbid it. Get behind me, Satan. Peter heard the truth. He rebelled against the truth that God gave him. He opened the door to demonic activity. Question. In what area of your life has God spoken to you that is truth that you are not presently following? You open your life. And by the way, to demonic activity, that doesn't mean your bed's going to start shaking at home. <laughs> that doesn't mean you're going to have visions and weird stuff happen. You know what it means? It means you're deceived. It means you'll be a Chip Ingram, like I was, who thinks you're, I am really, you know, I'm heading the women's ministry. I'm collecting clothes for the poor. I read my Bible in the morning. I listen to some of those radio people. Yay, yay, yay. <laughs> Except the fact of the matter is, is the Bible's really clear about forgiveness, and I've got bitterness in my heart toward my ex-mate, and I hate his guts, and I have anger fantasies. And there's a lady in the church that uh, we haven't talked to one another for four or five years. And yet the Bible is really clear that you are to forgive others the way I've forgiven you. And unless you do, you are on a journey of being deceived. The Bible is really clear about what you do with your resources. There's a priority to them. All you have belongs to God. There's certain things you need to do. You have time, you have talent, you have treasure, you have money. And the Bible says, first and foremost, above else, first give your first portion of your treasure to the Lord. Oh, well, you know, but that probably was written for other people at another time because, no, it's probably written for today and you're probably in denial. And if God doesn't have, according to Jesus, this isn't chip, according to Jesus, if God does not have your treasure, he does not have your heart, you're deceived. You're deceived. He says that there are people all around you and all around me that don't know Christ. And they're perishing. And he loves them. And I want you to build bridges the way I made you. You don't have to be Billy Graham. You don't have to be Luis Palau. You don't have to be a flaming evangelist. But out of your gift mix and out of your heart, if it's hospitality, invite them over. You know, if it's gift of service, go fix their car. But be a man or a woman who has a heart for lost people and how God made you love them out of compassion and build relationship so you get opportunity to bring people out of the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And if that's not happening in your life at all, you're deceived. So you don't have the breastplate of righteousness on. And so, you know, when I, your eyes, it's great. You tell me certain things, right? I bring those things up immediately I see guilt on some of your faces. Guilt. You're thinking, my money, I, I know that's not, oh, that, boy, that forgiveness one, boy. You know what? What if you just, and it says personal areas to address, what if you wrote something in there? You know, the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. That means you make time for God every day. And He understands days that are crazy, and it's not legalism, but it means that he matters most to you. He's the most important relationship, not evidenced by your lips, by evidence by your life. 
And if he's not, then what? You know the truth, but are you following it? If the answer is no, then there's not a breastplate of righteousness. If there's not a breastplate of righteousness, your heart is being condemned by the enemy and your mind is being deceived. And instead of your life reflecting the supernatural, winsome love and holiness of Christ, you're a religious person trying hard to please God, work out an agenda, and do your thing. And my fear is it's happening all over America. Does it mean you're perfect? Of course not. It means you deal with the area God has shown you. If He's shown you, quit watching so much TV. If He's shown you, break the habit with food. If He's shown you, go get counseling for your marriage. Are you ready? You, you, would you like to hear God's application? Just do it. Long before Nike, just do it. Just do what God has shown you. And I know there's fear and the temp, but you know what? Just once you take the first step to do that, whew, you'll get grace. He'll give you grace. The first time you give off the top, he'll give you grace. The first time you forgive someone that you don't want to forgive, he'll give you grace. The first time you say, I'm going to block off time that I don't have, I'm going to spend it with God, he'll give you grace. That's how it works. You put on the breastplate of righteousness. James puts it best, therefore to the one who knows what's right to do and doesn't do it, to him it is sin. Just missing the mark. And can I share just one thing before we move on to the last portion? God loves you. Okay? Some of you just got nailed. Okay? Riveted. He loves you. Why, why, why do you think he wants you to obey? Why, why do you think he said things about priorities and money and relationships and purity? You, you know why? Because the apple or the fruit that you're putting your teeth into is a sweet tart. And it looks sweet on the front end. And there's some pseudo intimacy and reward when you click on that porn site or when you take food that you don't need or when you harbor resentment. But it is a bitter pill to swallow. It will destroy you. It won't just hurt you. It'll destroy you. And he says, I love you. I love you. Will it be hard? Of course it'll be hard. Can you imagine how embarrassing it is to look back on two and a half years of your whole life and realize you've been completely deceived and instead of being a winsome testimony for Christ, I was a jerk. In fact, I had no spiritual opposition. I think Satan looked at a guy like Chip Ingram on a college campus and said, demons, don't mess with that guy. Don't mess with him. We got him. He's the, he's the worst advertisement for genuine New Testament Christianity. If we could multiply those kind of Christians, we could take, you know, vacation. God loves you. The only, every command is for your good. They flow from a father's heart. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. He wants you to have real intimacy, not pseudo-intimacy. He wants you to have real peace, not artificial peace that comes with eating something or going on a vacation or buying a pair of shoes. He, he, he wants you to have a, a clean heart and, and experience His power. Not little windows of just holding things, things at bay. So with that, let's look at our, our last. Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We've talked a little bit about what that is. Sandals that came up to here. They had knobs on the bottom and often nails that would come out. Uh, Alexander the Great, historically it was told, invented these or championed these. And he gave credit that when they went into battle because his troops had a firm foundation. In fact, in any athletic sport, I mean, you get, go with any coach, balance is the key. And the key to balance is you got to have a firm foundation. When I used to coach basketball, I tell my kids, and they never wanted to do it, you got to get down. You got to get down to play defense. Uh, wide receivers, guys, right? What happens when it's slick? When they try and make a cut, if they don't have a firm foundation, they fall down. Those of you that have little toddlers and you're really concerned about them and they're learning to walk, what do you want to make sure? You want to make sure the floor is not too slick or your little ones have the kind of shoes with rubber on the bottom, right? So they don't get hurt. And what we're going to talk about here is a foundation that supports this belt of truth and breastplate of righteousness. Truth, 
You're just honest with God. Breastplate of righteousness, you just apply what you know is true. Here, there's the metaphor. The word means, the preparation here means establishment. It's a means of a firm foundation. It conveys the idea of readiness to share the gospel, which brings peace between man and God. Now, we said Satan uses deception, okay. We said he uses condemnation to neutralize us. Now, he also specializes in casting doubt on the very basis of God's goodness and the means by which we received it, the gospel. He always attacks grace. If he can get Christians in a performance orientation, if he can get you doubting, is, is this, I mean, I don't know, when I've had doubts, I mean, he, he doubt, doubt, doubt. The, the passage there, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, or 2 Corinthians 11, 3 and 4, this is how he cast out. There's another gospel. He comes in the form of an angel of light, another gospel, another Jesus, another way. And, and he whispers to you, you, you don't really believe all this, do you? I mean, God created the universe, becomes a man, lives a perfect life, dies on a cross, resurrected, given the first portion of your money away, trying to live a righteous life in a polluted world. You know, when, when, you, when you go quit playing games and believing this religious stuff, you don't need that crutch. What, what, what's going on with you? Sure, surely, I mean, you're an intellectual person. You know, you've been to school and some of you to graduate school. And I mean, you're really going to believe this stuff about Jesus? Have I said enough? See, the firm foundation is understanding the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 5. Understand it clearly. Christ came, fully man, fully God, died for our sins, was raised from the dead. Where? This is in space-time history. He revealed himself to over 500 witnesses. This isn't a dream. It's not a religion. It's not an option on a religious salad bar that whatever you believe doesn't really matter. You know, just find fulfillment and peace in some sort of inner body journey. This is about a true life historical man who lived. It's verifiable. That's historical. And the good news, that's what gospel means. The good news is he died on a cross to pay for your sins. Sin and the sins of all the people and the power of sin is broken and Satan has been defeated and you are free. And behind all of the truth and behind the breastplate of righteousness is this gospel is what allowed you. This good news has transported you from the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light and he says it's your establishment and now there's a little debate. If you go into the commentaries, some are going to talk about it. the focus is establishment and footing. And others will say uh, this was, word was also used in ancient, ancient literature and had to do with readiness and being ready and quick to do things. But the idea is the sense of preparedness, alertness, and the foundation of your faith. So by way of application, you need to know and understand the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15 and Ephesians 2, 1 to 9. Second, you need to know the basis for your eternal security and the assurance of your salvation. You know, Romans 8, 38 and 39 is for uh, security and assurance, 1 John 5. I, I remember a young man um, who was on, you know, the singing groups that kind of travel around with colleges or some really good singing groups and they come to churches, give a concert and stay in people's homes. And one of the real good singers, this was many years ago, and uh, we were in the back afterwards and he said, can I ask you a question? I said, yeah, and we talked a little bit and he said, can I email you? I said, well, sure, and he did, long, long email. Here's a guy that had been doing Christian work for about eight or nine years, was completely paralyzed because he'd have these overwhelming doubts, wondering whether he's really in the faith or not. See, 1 John 5, this is the record that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that has the Son has life. He that does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I've written to you in order that you may know. See, the shoes, the gospel, the truth, the freedom, the grace, the assurance. Satan comes and whispers. And that's why it's such a powerful thing to know that faith is based on facts, not feelings. You know what? You get two or three hours sleep, travel a lot, go through a difficult time, have uh, some hard circumstances, uh, have conflict with someone you care about, do all that in about five or six days, and then not feel like reading the Bible, not feel like praying at all, and then have someone whisper in your ear, you don't really believe this, do you? You been there? I've been there. But I've, I've been there on overseas trips where I was going around the world to teach other people about Jesus, and all the time changes and get about four hours sleep in about three days. And I've been on a plane and thinking, I need to read my Bible. 
I don't want to read my Bible. This would be a good time to pray. I don't want to pray. You've just been telling thousands of people about Jesus and you do not want to read your Bible or pray? I bet none of it's real. You're a phony. And all of a sudden you realize, you know something? Circumstances, you can have bad enchiladas and have feelings that aren't very good. <laughs> but I'm glad that I could say, Satan, get behind me, number one. I've believed in the gospel. I know I'm saved because I'm in Christ. It's fact, it's data. It's true. And you base it on the facts and not your feelings. And then what I found, and boy, I just so encourage you, sharing your faith is one of the most powerful faith builders available. The best defense is a good offense. And as you, as you share, and I understand it's threatening for many of you, you don't have to tell the whole story, but as you identify with Christ, as you share your faith, the, the most vibrant time I think I ever had in terms of my confidence in who God was is I played basketball overseas in the summer of 76 and 77 uh, with some college players, and we played all throughout South America. And I would share the gospel on a bad day 10 or 12 times, on a good day 20 times. And all I can tell you is, see, Paul says in Romans 1:16, what? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation. As we wrap up this message, there may be some next steps you need to take, and we'd like to help you on that journey. If today's topic raised some additional questions or issues that you'd like to explore more in depth, take a look at Chip's series, Diabolical, Satan's Agenda for Planet Earth, including you. In addition, be sure to take some time to visit our website where you'll find a number of free resources, information on all our audio and video series, as well as timely updates and information from Chip. The web address is simply livingontheedge.org. That's livingontheedge.org.